The palace doors are thrown open and guards appear at the doors. But here comes Creon, new king of our land, son of Menesius. Thanks to the gods who've brought about our new good fortune. What plan of action does he have in mind? What's made him hold this special meeting, with elders summoned by a general call? Enter Creon from the palace. Men, after much tossing of our ship of state, the gods have safely set things right again. Of all the citizens, I've summoned you, because I know how well you showed respect for the eternal power of the throne, first with Laius and again with Oedipus, once he restored our city. When he died, you stood by his children, firm in loyalty. Now his sons have perished in a single day, killing each other with their own two hands, a double slaughter, stained with brother's blood. And so I have the throne, all royal power, for I'm the one most closely linked by blood to those who have been killed. It's impossible to really know a man, to know his soul, his mind and will, before one witnesses his skill in governing and making laws. For me, a man who rules the entire state and does not take the best advice there is, but through fear keeps his mouth forever shut, such a man is the very worst of men, and always will be. And a man who thinks more highly of a friend than of his country, well, he means nothing to me. Let Zeus know. The god who always watches everything. I would not stay silent if I saw disaster moving here against the citizens, a threat to their security. For anyone who acts against the state, its enemy, I'd never make my friend. For I know well our country is a ship which keeps us safe, and only when it sails its proper course do we make friends. These are the principles I'll use in order to protect our state. That's why I've announced to all citizens my orders for the sons of Oedipus. Edocles, who perished in the fight to save our city, the best and bravest of our spearmen, will have his burial, with all those purifying rituals which accompany the noblest corpses as they move below. As for his brother, that Polynices, who returned from exile, eager to wipe out in all-consuming fire his ancestral city and its native gods, keen to seize upon his family's blood and lead men into slavery. For him, the proclamation in the state declares he'll have no burial mound, no funeral rites, and no lament. He'll be left unburied, his body there for birds and dogs to eat, a clear reminder of his shameful fate. That's my decision, for I'll never act to respect an evil man with honors in preference to a man who's acted well. Anyone who's well disposed towards our state, alive or dead, that man I will respect. Son of Menesius, if that's your will for this city's friends and enemies, it seems to me you now control all laws concerning those who've died, and us as well, the ones who are still living. See to it, then, and act as guardians of what's been proclaimed. Give that task to younger men to deal with. There are men assigned to oversee the corpse. Then what remains that you would have us do? Don't yield to those who contravene my orders. No one is such a fool that he loves death. Yes, that will be his full reward indeed. And yet men have often been destroyed because they hoped to profit in some way. Enter a guard, coming towards the palace. My lord, I can't say I've come out of breath by running here making my feet move fast. Many times I stop to think things over, and then I turn around, retrace my steps. My mind was saying many things to me. You fool! Why go to where you know for sure your punishment awaits? And now, poor man, why are you hesitating yet again? If Creon finds this out from someone else, how will you escape being hurt? Such matters kept my mind preoccupied, and so I went slowly and reluctantly and thus made a short road turn into a lengthy one. But then the view that I should come to you won out. If what I have to say is nothing, I'll say it nonetheless, for I've come here clinging to the hope that I'll not suffer anything that's not part of my destiny. What's happening that's made you so upset? 
I want to tell you first about myself. I did not do it, and I didn't see the one who did, so it would be unjust if I should come to grief. You hedge so much. Clearly you have news of something ominous. Yes, strange things that make me pause a lot. Why not say it and then go? Just leave. All right, I'll tell you. It's about the corpse. Someone has buried it and disappeared. After spreading thirsty dust onto the flesh and undertaking all appropriate rites. What are you saying? What man would dare this? I don't know. There was no sign of digging, no marks of any pickaxe or a mattock. The ground was dry and hard and very smooth, without a wheel track. Whoever did it left no trace. When the first man on day watch revealed it to us, we were all amazed. The corpse was hidden, but not in a tomb. It was lightly covered up with dirt, as if someone wanted to avert a curse. There was no trace of a wild animal, or dogs who'd come to rip the corpse apart. Then the words flew around among us all, with every guard accusing someone else. We were about to fight, to come to blows. No one was there to put a stop to it. Every one of us was responsible, but none of us was clearly in the wrong. In our defense, we pleaded ignorance. Then we each stated we were quite prepared to pick up red-hot iron, walk through flames, or swear by all the gods that we'd not done it. We'd no idea how the act was planned, or how it had been carried out. At last, when all our searching had proved useless, one man spoke up, and his words forced us all to drop our faces to the ground in fear. We couldn't see things working out for us, whether we agreed or disagreed with him. He said we must report this act to you. We must not hide it. And his view prevailed. He was the unlucky man who won the prize. The draw. That's why I'm here now. Not of my own free will, or by your choice. I know that. For no one likes a messenger who comes bearing unwelcome news with him. My lord, I've been wondering for some time now. Could this act not be something from the gods? Stop now before what you're about to say enrages me completely and reveals that you're not only old but stupid, too. No one can tolerate what you've just said when you claim gods might care about this corpse. Would they pay extraordinary honors and bury as a man who'd serve them well, someone who came to burn their offerings, their pillared temples, to torch their lands and scatter all its laws? Or do you see gods paying respect to evil men? No. No. For quite a while, some people in the town have secretly been muttering against me. They don't agree with what I have decreed. They shake their heads and have not kept their necks under my yoke, as they are duty-bound to do if they were men who are content with me. I well know that these guards were led astray. Such men urge them to carry out this act for money. To foster evil actions, to make them commonplace among all men, nothing is as powerful as money. It destroys cities, driving men from home. Money trains and twists the minds in worthy men, so they then undertake disgraceful acts. Money teaches men to live as scoundrels, familiar with every profane enterprise. But those who carry out such acts for cash sooner or later see how for their crimes they pay the penalty. For if great Zeus still has my respect, then understand this. I swear to you on oath. Unless you find the one whose hands really buried him, unless you bring him here before my eyes, then death for you will never be enough. No, not before you're hung up still alive and you confess to this gross, violent act. That way you'll understand in future days, when there's a profit to be gained from theft, you'll learn that it's not good to be in love with every kind of monetary gain. You'll know more men are ruined than are saved when they earn profits from dishonest schemes. Do I have your permission to speak now, or do I just turn around and go away? But I find your voice so irritating. Don't you realize that? Where does it hurt? Is it in your ears or in your mind? Why try to question where I feel my pain? The man who did it, he upsets your mind. I offend your ears. My, my, it's clear to see it's natural for you to chatter on. Perhaps. But I never did this. This and more. You sold your life for silver. How strange and sad when the one who sorts this out gets it all wrong. 
Well, enjoy your sophisticated views, but if you don't reveal to me who did this, you'll just confirm how much your treasonous gains have made you suffer. Exit Creon back into the palace. The doors close behind him. Well, I hope he's found. That would be best. But whether caught or not, and that something sheer chance will bring about, you won't see me coming here again. This time, against all hope and expectation, I'm still unhurt. I owe the gods great thanks. Exit the guard away from the palace. Second Ode there are many strange and wonderful things, but nothing more strangely wonderful than man. He moves across the white-capped ocean seas, blasted by winter storms, carving his way under the surging waves engulfing him. With his teams of horses he wears down the unwearied and immortal earth, the oldest of the gods harassing her as year by year his plows move back and forth. He snares the light-winged flocks of birds, herds of wild beasts, creatures from deep seas, trapped in the fine mesh of his hunting nets. O resourceful man, whose skill can overcome ferocious beasts roaming mountain heights, he curbs the rough-haired horses with his bit and tames the inexhaustible mountain bulls, setting their savage necks beneath his yoke. He's taught himself speech and wind-swift thought, trained his feelings for communal civic life, learning to escape the icy shafts of frost, volleys of pelting rain in winter storms, the harsh life lived under the open sky. That's man, so resourceful in all he does. There's no event his skill cannot confront, other than death. That alone he cannot shun. Although for many baffling sicknesses he has discovered his own remedies. The qualities of his inventive skills bring arts beyond his dreams and lead him on, sometimes to evil and sometimes to good. If he treats his country's laws with due respect and honors justice by swearing on the gods, he wins high honors in his city. But when he grows bold and turns to evil, then he has no city. A man like that, let him not share my home or know my mind. <laughs>